Verily, he is the master of entire creation. This I may never ever forget even for a moment. This I may never ever forget even for a moment. This is the secret. Once we understand this, that he is the creator of the entire creation, the small, the big, the tall, the fat, the black, the indigo, whatsoever is created on the earth, he is the master of everything. He is the creator. When you remember this, naturally harmony comes into existence. Our problem is, we consider that I am an Indian, you are a Hindu, next one is Christian, I am a man, you are a woman, I am African, you are American, so on and so forth. We are divided in millions of ways. But amidst all, there are certain things which are common. And what is common? You draw your energy from sun, every one of you. Everyone breathe the fresh air that comprises the entire cosmos. The, and there are invisible hands. Nanak says, Sabna jiya ka ek data. Sabna jiya ka ek data. So may bisur na jai. He is the master of the entire creation. This I may never ever forget even for a moment. Nanak uses the word Sahib. Sahib is the word that was used during the British time for the white people by the Indians. Or you can literally translate into Sir or Mr. Whenever we are talking to someone, we say Sir. And his name is the embodiment of truth. You, and he says, Nanak says, you go on demanding, unconsciously and consciously, give me this, give me that, fulfill this wish and that wish. You don't realize that he goes on fulfilling all your demands. What a person can do to reach his abode, Nanak says, meditate on divine glories. What God has given me, tremendous benedictions. And what time to meditate on this? Amrit Vela. Amrit means nectar. Vela means time. The time when nectar flows into existence. There are two moments. Amrit Vela is the time when consciousness ch changes its gear. You are awake. You lie down on the bed, keep your head on the pillow. You are waiting. Sleep has not come. A moment comes when you are neither asleep nor awake. That is the moment the consciousness changes the gear from waking to sleeping state or sleeping to the waking state. It is at that time when you need to meditate. In the morning, there is a time when it is neither the night is coming to an end, the darkness is disappearing, sun has not risen as yet, but it is a dawn. The birds begin to chirp and bring the message that dawn is coming. This is known as Amrit Bela. And a similar time comes in the evening when the day is coming to an end. Those who are familiar with English poetry, they will recall a 17th century poet Thomas Gray, who wrote elegy written in a country churchyard and that begins, it's the longest elegy written by anyone. It begins, the curfew tolls the knell of the parting day, the lowly wind slowly, homeward plots his way, the, the cow herd is returning home, there is dust flying, the day is coming to an end and the poet says he is standing in the graveyard, everyone is leaving him to the darkness and the silence. 
Day is coming to an end. The light is fading. Night has not approached. When the two merge into one another, that is known as Sandhya Kal or the evening time for prayer. Muslims has a prayer at that time and in the morning also at the time of dawn. Nanak says meditate on divine glories at that moment. Human body comes into existence through action and the door to salvation or moksha opens through the grace of the Master. Nanak says truth alone is Truth is the supreme manifestation. There are two ways through which you can get connected to God. First is the way of the philosophers. Accordingly, one talks about God, just talk alone. And philosopher is barren. It is intellectual. It is prosaic. Nothing grows there. The other is the path of devotion. This is flowing. This goes on overflowing. Bhakti or devotion does not look God as a mere principle. Instead, it connects the seeker to God as a relation. That is why Sufis call it lover and beloved relation. Bhakti or devotion begins with a relation and until any relation is not established, ripples do not arise in the heart. You must feel something for the other, the master or feel his presence. Then the ripples begin to arise in the heart. How can you get connected to truth between you and truth? There can be no relation, no need to meditate on truth. Truth is the way of understanding, not a relation. Nanak has given a new name to that which is, and the name that he has given is Sahib or Sah. You can get easily connected to Sahib. Your love, your devotion, your dedication will easily bridge you with God as Sahib. The moment you address God as Sahib or Beloved, a loving relation is established, he becomes Beloved, a new way is open. A devotee wants nothing except that he can touch, he can feel within as well. He wants someone around whom he can sing, dance and keep his head at the feet and cry to his heart's content. Sahib is the most beautiful name. There are other ways of connecting to God as well. Sufi says God is beloved. And then the seeker is the lover. Hindus, Jews, Christians have considered God as father and then aspirant becomes son. Nanak called God as Sahib. Then the seeker is the serpent or attendant. Try to understand this. From each relation a different path evolves. In lover-beloved relation, both are at the same plane. The lover and the beloved. Neither is higher or lower. Now the father and the son relation is based on family values and traditions. However, in none of these relationship ego can really dissolve because when you are at the same plane then ego remains. When you are father the God is father and you are son. There always remains a conflict between father and son. Nanak says ego can dissolve only when the relation is based around master and disciple. He is the master and I am his servant. This is difficult. 
This is against ego. Ego considers being the master. You are just looking to it. And the entire creation is my servant. Ego thinks. Ego thinks the other has to listen to me, listen to my dictates and act as I say. Husband says the same to the wife. Wife accepts the same from husband. Father wants the child, the son to listen to him. The son wants father to adjust to his needs. A devotee, on the other hand, considers entire existence as the manifestation of one creator. Then he considers entire creation as master and he is the servant. This understanding is the real head stand. Head symbolizes your conditionings, belief systems, the past, the memory, and all that is encompassed as ego. Keeping the head down is not a mere symbol. And the day you understand, ego dissolves. You go on the street, a beggar asks something. Does this asking create any relationship or any ripple in your heart? Not really. Instead, you shrink deep within. And even if you give something, it is rarely done willingly. You consider yourself greater than the beggar. There is a gap between gap of have and have not. This is the way of ego. Ego considers itself separate from the whole. Next time, when you happen to pass by the way, try to be very cautious. When you find someone asking you and you find that you are shrinking, when contrary to this, when no one asks, you feel like giving. Yesterday after in the morning, I put the feet for the birds. Early in the morning, they gather and start making the noise. At times, they knock at the door as well. In the afternoon, as I came out of the door, many birds gathered and started making the noise. I took out the feed and gave it to them. When you give something, to someone feel grateful that the other has accepted your offer. Not that the other does not have and you have. No, I am giving out of my gratitude towards the other. If you understand this, then naturally the way towards God opens automatically. When there is a demand, you shrink. In that case, how do you expect your demands will be appreciated? Buddha told his monks to wait at the door and do not ask. As soon as they reach, they simply chant Bhikshan Dehi. Devi, O sustainer of this house, Bhiksham, give me arms. And if there is no reply, you proceed to the next door. This is the difference between a monk and man of understanding and a beggar and a man of ignorance. We give importance to monks. At this, monks inquired from Buddha, how can one get without asking. Buddha responded, in the realm of God, things happen differently. When Buddha said, do not ask, just stand at the door, make your presence, and if no response comes, 
move to the next door. Monks inquire unless I ask how will people give. This is the general understanding. Buddha responded in the realm of God, things happen differently. You are separated from God only because of your demands. All your prayers are your requests and demands. In fact, you are using God as your servant or wish-fulfilling device. Nanak says when he is the master and you are the servant, then why demand? The beauty is that he keeps on fulfilling your demands. It is not that by asking you do not get. Certainly you get. Another significant thing happens, the more you demand, the more you move away from God. All your demands indicate one thing that you consider yourself to be the master and your demands are inf infinite. This is the reason that you are in the service of God. Nanak says if he is the master and you are the attendant, then why demand? Demand can never become prayer. So too, your lust can never become prayer. The very understanding or understanding of prayer is thankfulness, gratitude. A real seeker goes on thanking alone. He goes, Nanak says, he goes on giving and like a beggar you go on asking for more and more. Nanak says, if you go on asking, then when your prayer will begin, when will, you worship, when will your worship begin? There is no end to asking. One is fulfilled, many more mushroom. So is the case with your lust. When will your way of gratitude begin? When will you be finished? Mind can never be finished. And what is mind? It is the aggregate of your demands. There is no bigger beggar than the mind. Mind goes on singing, give me, and goes on asking again and again, more and more, give me this, give me that, and again and again. Alexander the Great is a beggar like your beggar on the street. Nanak says, try to understand this nature of the mind. How can mind pray? Mind, prayer is a state beyond the mind. It is no mind or a state when the mind does not exist. The moment mind is no more, complaints vanish and you will come to realization that you are given more than you deserve. How many of us feel that we are given more than I really deserve? The moment you feel this, that God has given you everything, more than you can conserve, gratitude is born in you. You are full of gratitude. The moment mind is no more, complaints vanish and you come to realization that you are given more than you deserve. Mind looks at what is not the moment mind is no more, a feeling of gratitude arises. It is like a person who visits a rose garden. He will only notice thorns. He will go on counting the thorns. His focus is on thorns. He will say, so what? Even if a flower is there, what does it matter amidst thousands of thorns? He will be cautious even to pick the flower because of thorns. He is right in his logic. How can a flower grow amidst thorns? And when his mind is pricked by so many thorns, he will be filled with fear. He cannot even trust the presence of a flower. To him this may be his illusion or dream. If you go on counting the thorns, you can never trust the flower. On the contrary, when your focus is on the flower, again and again I give you 
in the words of William Shakespeare, none so vile upon this earth that live. Everyone has something good to give. But do we really understand this? When your focus is on the flower and you are absorbed in the flower, its beauty, fragrance, its touch, then another state arises. You will say when the flower is so beautiful, then what is the relevance of thorn? And even if thorns are surrounded, these are to protect the flower. And when thorns and flowers are together, certainly this will be the scheme of God. Maybe flower cannot remain without thorns. Thorns are there to guard the flower. Thorns are protecting the flower. As your love for flower increases, you will find same towards the thorn. And then for you there will be no conflict between thorn and flowers. Mind looks at thorns, mind complains, mind looks at the shortcomings, mind feels the dissatisfaction and such a person is beggar. When he goes to the temple, he goes for begging. Go beyond the mind and you will see flowers all around. This is beautiful. It is said God gives with thousand hands and only thing is that is needed a heart beyond complaints, full of gratitude. Nanak says people go on glorifying him and yet still go on asking for more and more. Like a blind we go on complaining of our thirst and never realize that the rain of bliss is all around. What can be done or put in front? so that you can witness the bounties of God? What can we carry in front of him to express our gratitude? What to offer at his altar? You offer flowers and flowers are the offering of the tree at the altar of God already. Flowers are his and these were alive on the tree. Away from the tree there is no aliveness. Everything is given by him. What can you really offer? You can build a new place of worship. Have you thought what are you doing really? In fact, you are returning all that is given by him. And you feel arrogant that you have built this temple or church or mosque. This only indicates one thing. There is no end to your ego. You are offering all that is given by him and you do not think even for a moment what are you saying. Nanak says saffron color rice, borrowed flowers and leaves, money will not help. The moment you realize that everything belongs to God, you are accepted. That very moment. Nanak says this understanding that everything belongs to him is religiousness. Can you really find any religious person who has such an understanding around? Nanak goes on singing and inquiring and also reminding you what to do again, what to do to attain thy grace and benediction. Only this understanding is needed that everything is given to me by God. Everything in this existence is offered at his altar already. These flowers, leaves, the sun, the moon, the stars are all offered at the altar. When you have your eyes open, you will realize that entire existence is prayerful. Every morning the flowers blossom. It is a thankfulness of the tree towards God that you have given me an opportunity to blossom. A flower is the, is the gratitude of the bud that you have given me an opportunity to blossom. I offer. And this is 
your thing offered to you. This is Nanak's way. Which language should you speak? How to please him? And what to do to gain his love and grace? Nanak does not seem to answer this question. Simply he has raised a question and left. This is the methodology of a master. Only an ignorant one can use the words. The one who knows finds no word can become a prayer. Then what can wise do? An ecstatic Nanak says, Meditate, introspect the glories of that which is formless in the moment when consciousness is changing the gear or early in the morning. Try to understand this word Amrit Vela. What Hindus call as Sandhya Kal, Nanak calls it Amrit Vela. It is beautiful. For centuries, Hindus have been working in their search for truth, awakening various paths for the transformation of consciousness and there is nothing that is left untouched by Hindus. Hindu scripture Upanishads reveal that in every 24 hours, there are two such moments when consciousness changes the gear. Try to understand this word. You go to sleep in the night. Between waking and sleeping, there is a moment when you are neither asleep nor awake. This is like changing the gear in the vehicle. The process of changing, in the process of changing the gear, there is a precise moment when your vehicle is neither of the gears. So too, both waking and sleep are two separate states. You are different in two states. In sleep, you can become a king. Then you are in a different gear. There is no connection between the two planes. And while dreaming, you never doubt. The moment you realize that this is a dream, dream disappears. There are various paths that give the methodology to the aspirants. Nanak says, when you go to sleep in the night, remember this is a dream. In the beginning, it is difficult for the aspirant to remember this. It takes nearly about three years for the remembrance to crystallize in an aspirant and the day the aspirant realizes that this is the dream, the dream is broken. Not only the dream is broken, instead the entire dream sequence is discontinued. Therefore, thereafter the aspirant does not dream. After this crystallization, consciousness does not have separate gears. All gears are now integrated. All the four levels of consciousness, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and the fourth dimension, which is beyond the three, are merged into one another. Now consciousness remains awake even during the deep sleep. Now the wall that separates various layers of consciousness is no more. There are two moments when in the night you go to sleep and the other is in the morning. During these two moments, your consciousness changes the gear. For a moment, everything comes to a total cessation. There is no thought, no ripple, just utter silence. In this moment, but this moment is precise, beyond time and space. This moment cannot be encompassed in finiteness. This precise moment Hindus call as Amrit Vela or Sandhya Kal. There is a reason in calling this moment Amrit Vela, the hour of nectar. Sandhya Kal is scientific in nature. Sandhya means the middle one. In such a precise moment, you are nearest to God. Nana calls this as the hour of nectar. The word is not only beautiful, it is nectrine. 
Nanak says in the moment you are close to nectar. Why am I saying you are close to nectar? And why I like this word all over other words? I will explain. 